What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can catch me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. And today's video is the final installment of my Dynasty running back rankings. This is running back 21 through 30. That's what it is. Let's do it. My running back 30, we're going to go 30 through 21. My running back 30 is Rashad White. He's currently being drafted in Dynasty at RB33, and so I'm a little bit higher on him. And basically the thing with him is he has a three-down skill set with decent draft capital, and he's on a great offense for now at least. You know, he's, he's six feet tall, 215 pounds, good size, good athleticism, you know, sub 4.5 in the 40, 87th percentile burst score, and he was really efficient as a runner in college. Box adjusted efficiency rating, which measures what is the average carry for this player worth given the box counts that he's seeing relative to what other running backs in the same offensive system are producing on a per carry basis. And Per that metric, Rashad White had an 86th percentile rushing performance in college, while according to relative success rate, which measures, given the box counts that he's seeing, how often is he like gaining a requisite amount of yards given the down and distance situations he's he's carrying the ball in, carrying the ball in relative to his teammates. And so it's it's a measure of, of down to down consistency. And so he was 86th percentile in overall efficiency, according to box adjusted efficiency rating, and only 44th percentile in relative success rate, which is a large disparity. And that indicates like volatile per touch output that's efficient, but not consistent on a down to down basis. You know, in, in the class of 2022, this rookie class that gives him like the number one disparity between those two things, the number one volatility rating in this class. He's a boom bust runner on a per touch basis, but he's also a really good receiver. I like to generate comps for players in particular categories using like a collection of metrics and in the particular like soup of receiving metrics that I use to evaluate running back prospects, I'm able to generate comps and in the top five receiving comps for Rashad White, we have guys Aaron Jones, Joe Mixon, and Alvin Kamara. Those three guys are in his top five. That's a stacked group of top five guys. He had a 97th percentile target share in college. He was split out wider in the slot, 82nd percentile um, amount of time. And he was 90th percentile yards per target. So he was used a lot. He was moved around the formation and used dynamically. And he was really efficient when he was throwing the ball. I think he's got like a wide range of outcomes here. I think David Johnson is his absolute ceiling. Like he could be one of the best like two-way dynamic runner, dynamic receiver threats at running back in the NFL. That's his absolute ceiling. I don't know if he ever reaches it, but I think he has that potential. But early on, I think he's got like a Charles Sims type floor, maybe tone. I mean, his floor is probably lower than that, but but that's, you know, like a base level outcome um, would be positive for him. A Charles Sims level kind of role here in Tampa Bay, but like Tony Pollard upside where he's just like the one B to Leonard Fournette playing more as the space back where Fournette handles like the early down um, between the tackles work. I don't know that Rashad White is ever particularly suited to that, but David Johnson wasn't either. David Johnson was never a great peer runner, but he was able to make an impact because he was dynamic overall, despite being not so consistent, and he was so explosive as a receiver. And so in my conversation with Graham Barfield a couple weeks ago, he does not view Rashad White as an immediate threat to Leonard Fournette's job. Who really knows there? The immediate opportunity is a little bit murky, and how long is this landing spot juicy? You know, how long is Tom Brady here? Those are all questions here, but I think Rashad White's talent is enough to put him in my top 30 running backs in Dynasty. My RB29 is Damian Pierce, who's currently being drafted as the RB38. And basically the case for him is that he was elite on a per touch basis at Florida, and now he's on the most wide open depth chart in the league. There's just nobody else here, really. Um, and he was, you know, to back up that that statement of him being elite on a per touch basis, box adjusted efficiency rating in 2021, 133%, which means the average carry for Damian Pierce, considering the box counts that he's carrying the ball against, considering the situations he's carrying the ball in, relative to his team at Florida, who are a really talented group. They get, you know, four and five star recruits there at Florida. The average carry for Damian Pierce was worth 133% the output of the average carry for other Florida running backs. That's pretty impressive. And his relative success rate was 18.7%. That means he's succeeding, given the box counts that he's seeing, he's succeeding on almost 20% more of his carries than the other backs at Florida. Both incredibly high. The uh, uh, kind of an average between the percentile ranks of his box adjusted efficiency rating and his relative success rate means that he was like the number one rated 
running back in like those two efficiency metrics in the SEC last season and the number third ranked running back in the entire country. And that follows up seasons where he was third in the SEC in 2020 and second in the SEC in 2019 among running backs who finished second on their team in carries. You can make a pretty good argument that at least last season, Damian Pierce was the best running back in college football because he was also a really good receiver. He was split out wider in the slot 24% of the time um, as a receiver. That's in the 89th percentile. He was targeted almost two yards downfield on average, 75th percentile. Only Damian Pierce and James Cook. Those are the only two players in this class who were split out wider in the slot over 20% of the time and who were targeted at least one yard downfield on average. Those are the only two guys. We know James Cook is an explosive, dynamic, elite receiver at running back. Damien Pierce is the same type of dude on lower volume. And on those advanced targets, he had an 88.2% catch rate, which is in the 91st percentile. So he's being moved all around the formation. He's being targeted downfield and he's catching a very high percentage of his passes. He might have the most complete skill set of any running back in this rookie class. I don't know that that means he's the best running back in this rookie class. I think, you know, there are things that like Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker do better than him. They got more opportunity, obviously, probably through their draft capital. But I think as far as like complete skill sets, he doesn't have any holes in his game. And he landed in Houston where they, you know, this is a wide open depth chart. I like Marlon Mack. Um, Hopefully he's got some juice left. But even if Damian Pierce like gets the lead back role this year. I don't know that that happens, but even if it happens, people seem to be assuming that this is some sort of like short-term opportunity before Pierce gets replaced in 2023. I mean, I could see that happening. I don't know that I'm making that assumption. It's almost like people are, people think that like this landing spot was too wide open and that they're, you know, even with Pierce, they're going to, they're going to replace him next year. They're going to add somebody else, which is possible, but this is a wide open depth chart. And I think he has the talent to like seize a really strong role in this offense. Probably not a good offense, but opportunity is king. Damian Pierce Pierce has the skill set to make the most of whatever offer, of whatever opportunity he ends up getting. My RB28 in Dynasty, who's actually being drafted as RB30 right now, is Tony Pollard. And I feel like I'm a little bit low on him. Um, based on consensus ADP, I'm slightly higher than him. But I'm not super enthusiastic. And I really think that's just because we're running out of time for this like hypothetical value that he holds to materialize. Obviously, he's a dynamic runner. He has been that way for three years now, even going back to college. In a limited role, he's never been the lead back. Generally, that's not something that I particularly care about. I just want guys to be like efficient and dynamic in whatever role they have have, but he's like fairly thinly built. He's not a super stout guy. And so I don't know that teams will ever view him as a guy who should get a lead role, but nonetheless, he's been a dynamic runner in a limited role throughout his career. He's obviously an explosive receiver, but I feel like if Zeke doesn't get hurt, what, like, what are we hoping for here? You have a flex level player. I think Tony Pollard is a flex level player, regardless of whether Zeke gets hurt or not. But if Zeke doesn't get hurt, you have a, you have a flex level player who essentially you're hoping to cash out on when he enters free agency next season, when he'll be a 26 year old. We're quickly reaching the point where like Tony Pollard is going to be at the age apex before we know it. And if Zeke doesn't get hurt this year, he will have never like materialized this hypothetical like RB1 level upside that he has before he gets like a Chase Edmonds, Tevin Coleman type deal in free agency next year, where who knows if he ever like hits in that scenario. We're probably just holding and hoping to cash out next offseason. I like Tony Pollard. We're just kind of like running out of avenues for him to like make good on whatever hypothetical upside he had. My RB27, who is being drafted currently as the RB28, so I'm slightly higher on him, is Clyde edwards helaire um, I mentioned him in a video a couple weeks ago. I um, broke him down a little bit, but I fully realize that this is like the most fragile ranking on this list. Like Clyde edwards helaire is in a situation where like by week two or three, we could realize, okay, this dude's like getting the work we've always wanted him to get. Like he should be like a top you know, a top 20 running back in Dynasty now. Like, we were ranking him too low. It it could be like week two or three when we realized, okay, this guy's getting the work we thought he should get. RB27, RB28 was too low. Let's move him into the top 20. Or it could be week two or week three, Jeremy McKinnon's running ahead of him. Uh, Isaiah Pacheco's getting early down work. Like, Ronald Jones is is getting most of the work. Like, there are a lot of scenarios here where it could be just like, Edwards Alera could be essentially done in Dynasty by like week three or four of this next season because it's been now three years where he just hasn't done shit. But I do think he's still a good player. Both years in the NFL now, he's had like positive box adjusted efficiency ratings. Um, Going back to 
to his time at LSU, 153% box adjusted efficiency rating that year, 6% relative success rate. That made him the number two back in the SEC based on a composite of those two metrics. He was really good, like legitimately really good in college, even considering the context of the offense he was in. And he's been solid as a runner through two years in the NFL. It's been as a receiver, strangely, because that was such a strength of his coming out. It's been as a receiver where he's been disappointing. And his rookie year, he had a 10.3% target share, which is pretty solid. And last year, it dipped down to 5.8%. So he was being used almost half as much as a receiver, even though that's like hypothetically his biggest strength. And I've been working on some new receiving metrics meant to quantify like the value of a player's, essentially of a player's route tree, like how advanced are the routes that this guy is running beyond like the basic, you know, swing passes and things like that. How high value are the routes that he's running based on the expected value of a target on those routes. And in year one, in 2020, Clyde Edwards-Alaire was running like a very varied route tree. He was not specializing in like specific things. He was running a large array of routes. They weren't especially high value routes, but he was running a lot of them. Last season, his varied route tree became much more specialized. He wasn't being asked to do a lot of advanced things anymore. He wasn't asked to be doing a lot of like high value things anymore. He was being, being thrown low value targets on basic routes, and he was only running a few types of routes. So like not only did they scale back his volume, they scaled back his responsibilities as far as like the complexity and value of the things that he was doing as a receiver, which A, doesn't speak well to like how much they trust him. But I think he can do those things. We saw him do, you know, run Texas routes out of the backfield and excel on those in college. We saw him run a wide array of routes on a high target share as a rookie. I think he can return to that. And if he can, you know, like figure it out as a pass blocker, it could be wheels up. Through his career so far, he's played at a 17 game pace of just under 1300 yards, eight touchdowns and 41 receptions. And that 17 game pace would have made him the RB 13 in 2021. He needs to prove he can stay on the field via pass blocking. They need to use him more sensibly as a receiver, but I think the talent is there. This is a very fragile ranking. Could be way too low, could be way too high, but it's just kind of like, we'll see what we have with Clyde edwards at the early part of this season. My RB26, who's being taken as the RB26, is James Conner. Somehow I have him right at ADP, even though like I would be disgusted to take James Conner in Dynasty right now, because he was terrible last season. He scored a lot of touchdowns, but his box-adjusted efficiency rating was in the 21st percentile. The average carry for Conner was worth 82% the output of the average carry for other Arizona running backs. He was the worst lead back per that metric in the league in 2021, and out of 189 lead backs going back to 2016 in the NFL, his box adjusted efficiency rating ranks 178th. So he was the worst lead back in the context of the efficiency of the other backs in his offense last year, and in that same category, 178 out of 189 in the last, what, six years. He was really, really bad. I'm able to generate comps based on like volume, box adjusted efficiency rating, relative success rate, um, the box counts that they're seeing. I'm able to generate comps of like single season performances for these guys using these metrics. And the closest single season comps to 2021 James Conner are 2020 Kareem Hunt, who wasn't very good. 2016 Latavius Murray, who was hurt all season. 2021 Zeke, who's completely washed. 2020 Todd Gurley in Atlanta, who was completely washed. And 2019 Adrian Peterson, I believe for Washington that season, who was completely washed. So James Conner comps strongly to an injury-ravaged Latavius Murray and some of the most washed running backs we've seen in recent memory. And that comes after he posted positive team relative efficiency numbers throughout his career in Pittsburgh. And so it's like, okay, did he just suddenly drop off? I think that's a strong possibility. I think he played last season at, what, 26, 27 years old. There's a chance he just got old, didn't have it anymore. But also there's a chance that like his team relative efficiency numbers in Pittsburgh were a little bit misleading about his true ability. The other running backs in the team there were terrible. And, you know, like Najee Harris smashed their efficiency last year, but we've seen him at Alabama smash the efficiency of some really talented running backs and then do it again in the NFL. And he did it to a much greater degree than James Conner did. But from what we've seen in the NFL from James Conner was smash the efficiency of shitty running backs in Pittsburgh and then be terrible in another situation in Arizona. So maybe he was never quite that good. Maybe he was good in Pittsburgh and then just fell off last season. I don't know what the case is, but he was bad last season. The immediate opportunity he had is likely still there but he could be cooked. I'm out on James Conner, even though I apparently have him where ADP has him. My RB25 in Dynasty is Elijah Mitchell. He's currently being drafted as RB23, so I'm a little bit lower. I'm pleasantly surprised that his ADP is this efficient, but I'm still not super enthused about him in general. And that's because he's never really been that efficient in the context of the offenses that he's played, even going back to college. In 2018, 
24th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating, 25th percentile relative success rate. In 2019, 0th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating. 2020, 35th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating. He's just never been efficient in the context of the other players on his team going back to college. And he wasn't efficient in the context of the other backs on his team last season in San Francisco, unless we remove Debo Samuel's contributions from the sample, which Debo Samuel's not technically a running back, but he was playing as one. There, I don't see any reason why we should do that. But the thing with Elijah Mitchell is that he's fast, and so he fits this, the 49er system perfectly. Like, he's he's well-suited to succeeding in this role as, like, a straight-line speed guy who has to make one cut and go in, like, a solid blocking offensive line with a good play caller. The question you have to ask ourselves, then, does that give him more staying power than, like, Raheem Mostert or Matt Breida had, who their thing, despite not being, like, especially good in college either, was that they had straight-line speed and could make one cut and succeed in this offensive system? Like, I don't see any reason why we should assume that Mitchell is not just, like, the latest random dude to get work and succeed in San Francisco when everybody gets work and succeeds in San Francisco. They've also talked this offseason about, like, wanting to limit running back injuries. They've, like, churned through these running backs who constantly get hurt year after year. They added Tyrion Davis-Price. Who really knows what happens in this backfield? It could just be Elijah Mitchell. It could just be the Elijah Mitchell show again. It could be more of a split. I don't know. I'm just not investing heavily in fifth-round running backs with weak profiles who succeeded in a situation where everybody succeeds. My RB24 in Dynasty is Josh Jacobs. I'm a little bit lower on him because he's being drafted right now as the RB22. And the thing with him is he's just like a solid player. He's not special. He's been propped up by opportunity thus far in his career. And it seems like that that opportunity he's been propped up by could slowly be going away. There's talk from the Raiders beat writers this offseason that it will be a committee this season. And if that's the case, then Josh Jacobs is essentially a less talented version of Antonio Gibson, who happens to be on, a, on an offense that's probably better. Imagine for a second that this is a committee. Like, where do the other backs in this offense fit into a committee? Zamir White only fits into this committee as an early down pounder, like a two down grinder. Kenyon Drake only fits into this committee as a pass catching back. They've got like Amir Abdullah on the roster right now, who's a pass catching back. They've got Brandon Bolden, who's like a jack of all trades. That situation, like the talent configuration in this hypothetical committee leaves Jacobs in a situation where he's just like straddling a low value fence in between these both roles. Like Antonio Gibson with JD McKissick there, probably isn't going to get high value targets, a lot of high value targets. Uh, Antonio Gibson with Brian Robinson there might be losing out on a lot of like goal line and like early down running opportunities. He's occupying like a very small sliver, a very not high value sliver of the Venn diagram there in the roles he's able to fill. Jacobs could be in the same shitty situation. He was the RB13 in PPR points per game last year with the number nine opportunity share in the league. He's not good enough to survive on a loss of volume unless he scores a bunch more touchdowns than he typically has. Like if he's losing receiving work, if he's losing running work, if that number nine opportunity share dips to number 15 or whatever, he's nowhere near an RB1. He could just be like a mid RB2 who provides no value over replacement in your fantasy lineup I don't know. He's he's a free agent after this season. I don't know that he's proven a whole lot that makes teams want to like invest in him heavily and give him a lead running back role anywhere else. He's just like a blah player in a blah situation. I'm not that interested. My RB23 in Dynasty, who's currently being drafted as the RB25, is AJ Dillon. And essentially what this situation for him is, is he's Tony Pollard with an extra year of value left. He's a year younger than Tony Pollard is. So he's Tony Pollard with another year and on a team more likely to give him legitimate immediate opportunity. I think Tony Pollard is cucked by Zeke a little bit. They're unwilling to move off of Zeke fully. I could see the Packers going like much more 50-50 here with Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon. I think his opportunity share for touchdowns specifically is likely increasing. That switched Aaron Jones had like 20 goal line opportunities in 2020, while A.J. Dillon had four. Last year, Aaron Jones had 15, while A.J. Dillon had 21. I could see that disparity growing in favor of A.J. Dillon this year. I think his rushing share, I'm um, just rushing, you know, opportunity share for carries, likely increases this year with Jones taking on more receiving work. And I think this could just be a more run-heavy game plan overall without Devontae Adams. And so opportunities for A.J. Dillon look like they're likely to increase. He has a reputation as a quality receiver, but I do I do think he's pretty limited there right now. 78.4% of his targets last season came on just basic routes. Screens, swing passes, throws to the flat, check and release routes where he like looks to see if he needs to block somebody and then just like releases if not. But he's been underutilized on the highest value of those basic routes. The, the, the highest expected value of those basic routes is the screen pass. It offers the most yards per target of any of those routes. Generally, the other ones, the swing passes, the, the passes to the flat 
are not very high value given the expected yards you would have on a target on those throws, which makes sense. And on a screen pass, you know, the, the defense has hypothetically collapsed on the quarterback, you dump it off over them, and then you've got like a wall of blockers to escort you on your way to eight yards. On a throw to the flat, you're running like towards the line of scrimmage, catch the ball, pivot and like there's potentially a defender right in your face with no blockers it, it makes sense that a screen is worth more and it just is the screen rate league-wide in the nfl last year for running backs 22.9 percent of all running back targets came on screens in 2021 16.2 percent of aj Dillon's targets came on screens last year and so while he's being used in very basic ways like a screen pass is a, is a basic you know task for a running back to accomplish as is a swing pass as is a throw to the flat Dylan is being used heavily on these types of plays, but not particularly on screens. And so I think he could get more touchdowns this year. There's more juice to squeeze out of him as a receiver, especially if he gets used more in the screen game. Aaron Jones has been targeted like 35% of his targets have come on screens. And so if they use A.J. Dillon a little bit more in the screen game, that that's a basic route that he can do. It's just much more higher value than what he's been doing. And so if, if they go there a little bit more, like there's, there's higher upside here for him as a receiver, even without him being asked to do super advanced things, he could score more touchdowns. He could be used more overall. I'm a little bit optimistic about A.J. Dillon going forward. I think there's a little bit more juice to squeeze out of A.J. Dillon than we've seen so far. My RB22 in Dynasty is David Montgomery. He's currently being drafted as RB18, which I would be completely fine with because, honestly, I have no idea where to put this guy. Throughout his career, he was elite in college. 185% box-adjusted efficiency rating his final year at Iowa State. 15% relative success rate. Absolutely elite. And then he's been good there in 2019 really good in 2020, took a big step back in 2021, but I think it might have been because he was hurt. Through week four, he was playing at a 1,300-yard pace at 4.5 yards per carry. After week four, once he came back from injury, 1,020-yard pace at 3.5 yards per carry. So he took a huge step back. There's lots of question marks here. Did injury cause his decline? Is there going to be more of a split with Khalil Herbert? Did the Bears re-sign him? Did the Bears extend him? If yes, like what does his offense look like? Is Justin Fields good? If they don't re-sign or extend him, is he an RB1 somewhere else? like tons of questions here I don't know the answers I could see him anywhere from like 15 to 25 um, in these rankings could all be reasonable this is just where I happen to put him um, my RB 21 is Ezekiel Elliott and basically my philosophy here is like I want to roster good players at cost and I'm just not sure that he's a good player anymore his efficiency metrics have taken a severe dip these last few years uh, box adjusted efficiency rating of only 83 percent last season negative relative success rate for two years in a row now and even the metrics that like don't account for Tony Pollard impact like he's ripping off 10 yard runs at a far lower rate than he used to he's converting those runs into longer runs in the secondary far less often than he used to he was doing that at like a 30 percent rate early on in his career's first three years the last three seasons he sent it at 10 percent 13 percent 12 percent terrible he's also dipped from like 20 carries a game to 14 carries a game last season he might just be cooked this is a good offensive situation perhaps good volume but rostering ineffective players because of their situation is a redraft play i'm not super excited about him in Dynasty. I'm actually higher on him than Consensus. He's being drafted as the RB24 in Dynasty right now, and I have him at 21. But I think that's really just because I'm lower on other players relative to where they're going, where, relative to where they're being drafted. So those are my, my RB30 through RB21. Thanks for checking it out. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, follow me on Twitter. Have a great weekend.